Uh, Greg, good afternoon all. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians uh, of the land we're meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders past and present, all other Indigenous Australians here today. Um, I was asked on the way in, is this, have I got words of wisdom? And I promised I could provide words. Um, and I'll leave the, the judgment as the wisdom up to you. Uh, but the broad topic uh, that I was asked to talk about was technology related. And uh, the, the use of technology, the digital divide, uh, and whatever collection of terms that we would like to use. Uh, and in the spirit of the, the, the great work, Greg, that you and the CIS do, and I think the underlying philosophy, um, rather than stand here and talk from the perspective of what the government should do or what others should do, uh, I really want to provide the perspective uh, as the leader of an organisation as to what we do and can do that's within our powers as executives or business leaders, uh, leaders of organisations that are seeing the opportunity of technology, uh, trying to capture it, responding to a lot of the challenges of technology. And so I'm not going to try and overreach. I'm not a technologist. Uh, I'm not a politician, I'm not a policy maker. Uh, so what I'm going to say is very much from the perspectives of the day-to-day -day managing and leading of organisations dealing with technology. Although as you'll see, and this is specifically relevant to us as the Commonwealth Bank, but I think to all large businesses in this area of technology, I think we've all got a, a role to play in the impact of technology in the broader community and jobs, education. I can see Angus here and we were talking about this uh, not long ago. Um, and really thinking about our role more broadly outside our businesses, but still as business leaders. Now, the starting point for me, uh, and again, I think about this from the CBA's perspective, is if you read newspapers and have a look around, you can be forgiven for thinking that all innovation is going to go from companies that have only been around for five years or have yet to be invented. Um, and the newspapers are full of the stories of the latest great examples of startup innovations, high valuations, new floats on the stock market. And there's a general view that everything else will be a dinosaur. Um, we certainly believe and see that there are all sorts of exciting ideas being brought to our business and other businesses and the community by startups. But the anchor of our thinking is we absolutely refute the notion that innovation and technology is only the domain of the startup. Uh, and a fundamental view of our position as the Commonwealth Bank is if the big dog can get off the porch, the big dog that's just sleeping there, very hard to move, the kids will sort of run past and taunt it knowing it won't move, and generally it won't. But if you can actually mobilise the big dog off the porch, then the big dog's actually capable of doing some pretty interesting innovation. And for those close uh, to the startup world and others uh, who see innovation, um, the thing that you always hear from people building companies is the two biggest challenges are capital and customers. Uh, the two things we have are capital, although we had a bit more before the last round of regulation, but we've still got a bit, and customers. So we start from the starting point of saying, for us as the CBA, we've got 105 years of history, we've got a very strong brand, we've got an entrenched customer base, we've got entrenched distribution, we've actually now got state-of-the-art infrastructure in terms of our systems, what can we do with it to innovate? And the topic's very fresh on my mind, not only because we think about it all the time, but in the last couple of weeks, we just happened to have had the buy annual leadership forums I have with my team's direct reports, so our top 100, and then two weeks later, their direct reports, so that's the top 300 of the organisation. And the starting point on many of these conversations, and particularly what we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, is I've said to our leaders, you need an emotional understanding, not an intellectual understanding, an emotional understanding of a couple of key points about our industry and our place in our industry. Point number one is that if we don't innovate successfully, we're toast. Not, we'll lose a bit of profit, we'll lose a few customers, we're toast. And I'm talking over a decade, not over six months, but it is an existential imperative for us to innovate. And you can just look around that in all sorts of parts of the industries that we're in, whether it's lending or payment systems, you can just see that the legacy business model is not going to work, it's actually got to evolve. But the second point that we need to understand is if we do do this successfully, 
then not only can we effectively defend the strong market positions that we've got, but we can actually extend them and improve them. And that's our challenge as a leadership team with technology. It's to understand, on the one hand, the threats of getting it wrong, but equally balance that with the opportunities of getting it right. Now, you're then probably going to ask, well, how do you do it? Uh, and the answer is, I'm not sure yet. I can just tell you what we're trying. Uh, because we certainly don't hold ourselves out as having all the answers or indeed any of the answers. All that we can do is share some of the experiences from an organisation that's taking this seriously. Um, and at the start, I, I just want to say the first thing we've got to talk about is what actually is this? So we all talk about technology, we all talk, talk about innovation, but what actually are we talking about? And to us, there are probably three areas of real proper R&D that lie at the core of what we think is going on. Number one is that computing power and the cost of computing and of data, on the one hand, power is surging up, on the other hand, costs are coming down. So simply put, computers can do a lot more, a lot cheaper. And that's a critical part of the innovation. Now, we're only at first base on this in the bank's own joint venture with the University of New South Wales in quantum computing. Uh, in our view, over 15 to 20 years, even what can happen now will seem like uh, ancient legacy. But that's part A of, the, of actually what is happening in innovation. Part B is that that's combined with the speed and the mobility of the infrastructure we've got for accessing the internet. Uh, so we can all think about when we thought dial-up was great, and it was great at the time. Now we're talking about speeds that are exponentially faster and actually be able to do it while we're on the fly. So you combine, the, and everybody's seen the, uh, the, the, the data showing the comparison between what your phone can do now relative to what mainframes could do in the 1950s and how mobile that is. And that leads to the third point, which is we've got a real innovation in hardware, in the user friendliness, in the mobility, in the general usefulness of all the hardware. So at the core of it, we've got the computing power up, costs down, better and mobile and faster infrastructure and better devices. And that's really at the core of what we consider to be the proper R&D. Then Above all that are all these use cases. And although we talk a lot about innovation and R&D in uh, financial services, a lot of it really is strong R&D, but it's actually a bunch of clever people saying, what can we do with faster computer power, with broadband, with mobile devices? So we're leveraging off the scientific innovation that's happening at the moment. And that's what leads to the payment apps and the different data we can provide and all sorts of other things that we're doing. So what we need to be thinking about as an organisation is understanding these fundamental forces of technology and then saying, how can we apply those to our business? And that's at the core of the technology challenge. In doing that, what we have to accept is that just as the world is innovating in terms of technology, the management model has to innovate. And you talked before, Greg, about McKinsey, and I know people like Rob will know this well, the management model never innovates as fast as the technology outside. In other words, a bunch of us are still thinking old school organisation structures, old school reports, old school ways of uh, interacting are still going to work, and that's not the case. Uh, we've actually got to understand as leaders that the management model of the organisation has to evolve. And actually, if I think about my job and indeed the jobs of my senior team, this is our number one challenge. There is not a single piece of good innovation that has come out of the Commonwealth Bank in the, in the five odd years since I've been running it that I have had anything to do with, not a single thing. Not a single idea I've thought up, not a single idea I don't think I've even made better. Uh, and I don't think there will be for as long as I'm here. All I can do is with my team, and the board try and create the conditions where the people who do have those smart ideas can think about them and bring them up and bring them out to the market. And the old ways of managing the organisation just don't work. So there are three or four different things uh, that we're doing in order to try and make that work a little bit better. The first is obviously starting with people. And it goes first of all to the kind of people that you've got in leadership roles. And if we think about the heads of the businesses that we've got in the Commonwealth Bank, our customer-facing businesses, in almost each case, if we had to, we could interchange them with the head of technology. Uh, they actually could run the group that we're called, calling enterprise services because they have a deep enough understanding of what the technology is going to do. 
Now, hopefully, they're also still good people leaders. They've got the great values that we expect. They need to be good risk managers in order to be able to give you money to develop your first floor here. Um, but equally, they've got to be understanding of and able to work through the opportunities of technology, and that's a core skill in the leaders. Number two on people, it actually brings this whole idea of diversity into a completely different domain. Now, we talk a lot, as other organisations do, about the importance of gender balance in our leadership, importance of inclusiveness for LGBTI colleagues, importance of not uh, judging people based on their age or culture, having opportunities for all, making the organisation uh, user-friendly for people with disability. They're all critical as good corporate citizens and to attract talent. But again, when you're trying to think about innovating, you need that diversity right through the organisation, not because it's a nice thing to do, but because it's strategically critical. And then you've got to find ways for everybody to work together when you do have the diversity. And there are a couple of aspects of that that are important. Number one is the physical environment really matters. And the physical environment we have in Commonwealth Bank Place, the physical environment we have in the new offices we've just opened in Brisbane, the physical environment we have in the offices we've got in Hong Kong and the ASB in Auckland are all very, very different from the environments that we used to have. Uh, and they are working to help people to collaborate. At the same time, we've got to understand that while we're trying to drive everybody to collaborate, we have a cadre of people in the organisation who are introverted coders and actually can't stand dealing with anyone else. And if we force them to collaborate with their colleagues, as we have tried to do in the past, they will leave as they have in the past. So this is another critical aspect of the diversity of working styles, is actually understand that the kind of people who are going to contribute to the Commonwealth Bank's success, other than their core values and motivation, may have a lot less in common than the people who may have been working in and running the Commonwealth Bank 20 or 30 years ago. So people at the absolute core of how we need to manage the organisation differently. Then we've got to think differently about how we develop customer offerings and bring them to market. And the old way this was done is that the business people, the product people, whatever you want to call them, would spend six months all working together to come up with a really great product. They would then have the big meeting with the technology people. The technology people would take the spec, say, thank you very much, it'll take us eight months and however many million dollars to build and normally 10 months and on double the budget, they would then come back and say, we've built it, we're ready to go, and it would be put out into the market. Now we think a lot more about what we call agile uh, development and minimum viable propositions going into the market. And our teams are working together, and I'll use this term in deference to uh, Mike Hawker here, in what we call scrums. And that means that from day one, the product people the technology people, the risk people, the audit people, the legal people are meeting together. That's why it's called a scrum. All around the same ideas, each understanding their own role, coming back often a day later or a week later, evolving the product very quickly, not till it's perfect, but till it's good enough to get out into the market. Getting it out into the market, trying it, learning from it, and then improving it for the next release or sometimes culling it. Uh, now, you can imagine that for a financial institution, this goes completely against the grain. We've got to be very difficult, uh, d very careful about some products with which we do that, both for customer friendliness reasons and also for regulatory reasons. But the idea now is very much getting cross-skilled scrums of people together, developing a minimum viable proposition, getting it quickly out to market and rapidly using the feedback to have it improved. So that's number two on the development. Number three is the resource allocation. Now, it's been the case until very recently that up to a reasonably low level, at least by our standards of investment, a project will come up to the executive committee that I chair for approval, primarily for delegation reasons. And the way this will typically go is entrepreneurs will come and explain something to us. We won't understand it, but if we think they look trustworthy, we'll give them the money and then they'll go away and do it and hopefully it will create value. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect here. What we've realised now is that we actually need to aggregate those pools of money to slightly higher sums, and as long as we've got the right risk appetite from both a risk and compliance perspective and the right accountability, give that larger sum of money to the entrepreneurs and say, come back in whatever period of time it might be, in a quarter, six months or a year, show us what you've delivered for the money. And if it's good, we'll 
give you more, and if it's not, we'll give you less. So to some extent, this becomes a lot more similar to the kind of disciplines that Simon and others here will know well. Uh, a much bigger part of our job, rather than assessing the idea, is to actually find the people and back the people against their record, and that's got to be a critical part of our resource allocation uh, exercise. And the last piece I'll talk about internally and then very quickly talk about a couple of external factors is just our approach to the outside world on two fronts. Number one is the newspapers are full every day of people telling us where the next threat is coming from tomorrow that's going to kill the business. And much of it is because very successful entrepreneurs have learned that one way of getting great values into their ideas is getting the hype into the ideas. Now, let me be clear, a lot of the ideas are fabulous. But what is the challenge for us is sorting out the genuine threats from the noise. And if I give you one very recent example, for years we have heard about the explosion of peer-to-peer -peer lending overseas. And about two years ago, it became clear that in a couple of the big cases, this wasn't peer-to-peer -peer lending anymore unless one peer is a hedge fund. It was actually shadow banking. And what was happening is that hedge funds were aggregating money under the guise of peer-to-peer -peer lending and giving them to small businesses and others to borrow. Now, those models, as those of you who are following this over the last couple of months will have seen, are now under significant stress. The principle of what has been called peer-to-peer -peer lending over time, I have no doubt, will become extremely successful. But the use cases that people were telling us within a very short period of time we're going to rapidly disrupt the business have now proven to be not the right use cases. So the two mistakes we can make is either overreact to what's coming out in the outside world or underreact to what's coming in the outside world. And that means the processes that we've got for looking around, understanding what could be a threat and what not, understanding who to partner with and not, are becoming a much more important part of what will determine our success. So we think about people, about development, about resource allocation, and about thinking externally. Finally, I'd like to think more broadly about how we need to think as a citizen of the economy that we're in, which itself as an economy is being disrupted by these technology forces. And we always say that for us as a financial institution, the number one determinant of our success will be Australia's success. There is no way that we are ever going to have management that is good enough to outperform the country. Uh, we may have management that's bad enough to underperform the country, but it's going to be very hard to outperform the country. And therefore, if we think as we encourage ourselves to do and try and force ourselves to do about 5, 10, 15 year increments, we have got to be thinking about the challenges that technology and opportunities is placing for the broader community and our part as an institution in helping the community adjust to that. And I want to talk here about jobs and schools and the digital divide. We will all have seen, and most recently I think, or not most recently, but Fry and Osborne, the Oxford academics in 2015, uh, predicted that 47% of the jobs in the United States uh, were capable of being automated. The OECD then looked at that number a few months later. Some other economists said, no, it's not, it's 9%, and they found different methodology changes. Uh, to us, it doesn't really matter whether you believe the 9 or you believe the 47. It's a significant number. And from us as a major organisation, but also a lender to other organisations, we really do need to understand that the traditional models of job creation, of job creation in, in roles which we in the old school would have considered blue collar jobs, are going to need to come from different sources from how they have historically. The answer for that is not going to be try and protect industries against the new world and against the global competition. The answer is having to think about what we are going to do as an organisation, our role in creating the jobs and the opportunities that are for people who are being displaced from tasks that are now being automated. And when we think about uh, robotics as an example, although we have not, and I don't think for a while we'll have 20,000 robots around our workforce, the principles of robotics are already being applied in some of the key processes that we have at the Commonwealth Bank. That leads directly to the second topic, which is we must, as employers, be prepared to play a role in shaping the shape of the education curriculum and the education system. 
and Angus and we work together on one aspect of this. We've got a very good partnership with Social Ventures Australia on this, our own Start Smart program in schools. This is very simply described by some as we just need to teach everybody to be coding, coders, and the importance of STEM. And there's no doubt that that is an important part of what Australia is going to need, but we're kidding ourselves if we think that the solution to keep the community socially vibrant and socially included in technology is that everyone's going to learn to be a coder and go to coding jobs. That is simply not the case. So we need to think more broadly in our schools about the role of creativity in the curriculum. Uh, my own personal view is that the performing arts become a far more important part of our community in this sort of environment. Uh, we need to be thinking about the ability to use technology to help teachers learn best practices, share best practices. We need to be able to think about technology uh, in terms of helping children build the different cognitive skills they need to interact better even with the most simple technology. And we need to be prepared to take a stand on that because we are employers and we are going to need some different skills from the education system than those that have made us successful for past decades. And then finally, we need to think about the role that we are going to play ourselves in helping bridge the digital divide. And again, and often technology's gotten on the one hand, on the other hand, there is no doubt that we can all see the power of technology to build inclusiveness, to help people get the same access to education, services, et cetera, no matter what their socioeconomic conditions are. But equally, we need to understand that if you don't have access to that technology, if you don't have access to the hardware, if you don't have the skills to use it, there is a real risk that technology is actually going to exacerbate the economic divide. And we have a role to play, certainly as the Commonwealth Bank, in thinking about that in terms of financial literacy and technology literacy. I know, for example, some of the telecommunication companies are doing the same thing in terms of just getting technology into people's hands. So we need to understand that if we don't play an active role in helping bridge that divide as business leaders, we are going to be in a situation in five or 10 years time with a greater divide we're already observing between the haves and the have nots has been exacerbated because the better technology is in the hands of the haves and the haves not are not able to have access to the same opportunities. So that's uh, pretty much all that I wanted to cover, really talking about how we're thinking about it internally and how we're looking about the outs at the outside world. Um, the last aspect that I would just finish off on, and again coming back to where I started, is a lot of us are looking to policymakers and government for the answers here. And for those of you who, like I do, think about this a lot, the more questions you ask, the more you realise the answers don't exist. And actually, therefore, we have to realise that the answers won't suddenly drop down from governments or policymakers or even businesses. We're going to have to be prepared to try stuff and experiment to create the answers. But to come back to what I said before, we've got to keep the balance here between understanding failure to evolve will create threats for all of us, individually in businesses and in the community, but by the same token, the ability to evolve successfully uh, will be the most exciting opportunity that any of us tackle. And with that, Greg, I'm happy to take some questions.